Now we're going to move on to a social bond theory by Travis Hershey. When criminologists talk about control theory, they're usually referring to Travis Hershey's social bond theory. And this is not a theory of what causes crime, but a theory of pro-social behavior, a theory that explains why we conform to the rules. So I want you to think of a time that you could have broken the rules or you could have broken the law, but you didn't. Why didn't you? So just take a moment and jot down what you were thinking, what you were doing that stopped you from breaking those rules, even though you had the opportunity to do it and you didn't do it. Okay, so Hershey argued that when we engage in deviant or criminal behavior, it is because we have weak or broken bonds to society. So people break the law because they have not internalized society's rules. Internalization requires strong social bonds to groups in society, like family, and to institutions, like schools and jobs. So social bonds do not reduce criminal motivation They increase one's ability to resist the temptation of crime or deviance. So with a nod to differential association theory, Hershey argued that social bonds remain strong only so long as they are nourished by interaction with conventional others, with other rule followers. So overall, Hershey argued that the presence and strength of social bonds can explain various levels of offending. If you watched the social learning or strain videos, you'll see that Hershey is challenging Sutherland's and Merton's theories, both of which argue that elements of social structure pushed or pulled people into crime. Hershey, on the other hand, says we're always pulled toward crime and something stops us. What differentiates offenders from non-offenders are the factors that restrain people from acting on those wayward impulses. Social bonds are the social controls that regulate those criminal or deviant impulses. Hershey discussed four social bonds that promote socialization and the internalization of social norms and conformity. And those are attachment, commitment, involvement, and belief. Up first is attachment. Attachment is the emotional bond. Attachment and sensitivity toward conventional significant others, such as parents, teachers, peers. Attachment to rule-following people who are important to us leads us to avoid their disapproval. This is the source of our conscience. We internalize the norms and values of people we respect and who care for us. We identify with and emulate the people who take care of us. If you remember from the discussion of Nye's framing of social control, this is indirect control. Closeness to important rule followers in our life leads us to care about their opinion, including their disapproval of our bad behavior. So as youths, we do not offend because we do not want to disappoint our parents or others that we're attached to, such as our teachers. Others become the source of our conscience. So the voice in our head telling us what's right or what we should do. That's our conscience. It comes from other people. So now thinking back to that time that you totally could have broken the law or the rules, but you didn't. Did you have your parents' voice in your head? Were you thinking about how important people in your life would disapprove? Did that contribute to why you didn't offend? Okay, up next is the material bond, commitment. This social bond argues that deviance places conventional investments at risk. So not offending is a rational choice. This bond is our stake in conformity. It it represents our commitment to a particular socially approved line of action and shows that we understand the ramifications of pursuing unconventional or deviant behaviors. Every time we put energy into achieving conventional goals, we reinforce this bond. When we put effort into getting good grades at school, when we invest in the human capital necessary to get a good job, a job approved of by our society, 
it reinforces our stake in conformity and shows our commitment to conformity. When we invest in social capital, those resources or benefits that are gained from and transferred through our social network of relationships and connections, we also reinforce our stake in conformity and following the rules. The social capital shows our social and community standing. If we were to engage in deviant or criminal behavior, we would risk damaging our social status. So, okay, thinking again about that time you could have broken the rules, but you didn't. Were you thinking about your social status or about how hard you'd worked to achieve what you had and that breaking that rule might jeopardize what you worked for? If so, it was this bond, the, the material bond commitment that was preventing you from engaging in deviant behavior. Okay, so the next bond is involvement. This is the temporal bond. This social bond really has to do with not having enough time to engage in deviant or criminal behavior. When we are involved in the legitimate use of our time and energy, we have less time for illegitimate activities. So have you heard the phrase, idle hands are the devil's workshop? That's the argument behind the bond of involvement. When we have too much idle time, we're more likely to simply have the time to engage in deviant and criminal behavior. So too much leisure time leads to problems. When we're involved in conventional activities like homework and work and sports, school activities, and other recreational pursuits, we just have less time for deviance. So this bond may not explain why you didn't engage in rule breaking, not all on its own, but that time when you didn't break the rules, were you just too busy fulfilling other conventional responsibilities? This is a rough one because being involved in other activities implies that you won't have the opportunity to be presented with a rule breaking possibility. Nonetheless, there's a good chance that you just had other things to do. You were occupied, you were engaged in other activities that didn't allow you to think of the idea of rule breaking. Okay, now on to the moral social bond, belief. This bond prevents us from engaging in deviant behavior because we believe in the rightness of conventional rules and we believe that those rules should be followed. We believe in the common value system in our society and, and we accept the moral validity of that central social value system. So we embrace the moral validity of the law and other conventional norms such as you know, school rules or workplace expectations. So we, we believe in the value of education, for example. We respect the law, we respect lawmakers and law enforcement. And when we believe in the moral order of our society, we lack those neutralization techniques that justify the act of deviance. If you saw the social learning video, you'll remember all those ways we rationalize our wrongdoing. But when we believe in the moral order, we might not even think of reasons why it's okay to break the rules. And if we do think of those reasons, we won't act on them. So moral beliefs restrain impulses to offend. And on the other hand, crime occurs when such conventional beliefs are weakened. So thinking about that time, you could have broken the rules and didn't. Were you thinking something like, that's just wrong. That's not okay. I'm not going to do it. If so then you were being constrained by this moral bond of belief. Okay, they, that's it. Thank you very much, Hershey, and your bond, social bond theory.